Hello, good morning to all, good afternoon. I would like to start this presentation. We are having one of our last events this year entitled Understanding Blockage to Peace and Counter Peace. With us today, Dr. Sandra Pogoda from the University of Manchester and Professor Marcus Allen from the Federal University of Paraíba. Welcome, both of you. Uh, in the name, in the name of the International Relations Research Center, as well as the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of São Paulo, I'd like to thank you for joining us on this event, and from as well those who are joining us today and this morning to talk about one concept, uh, one work that has been developed over a few years now, and. Well, he is one of the professors involved in this research to tell us a bit about a bit more about this conceptual approach to peace. Well, um, to start, I would like to first present our panelists and then first directly give them the floor. Each of them will have around uh, 30 minutes for their reflections and then we will open the floor for debate. I hope everyone enjoys the debate that we are promoting here. And I will start by introducing our external guest, Dr. Sandra Pogode. She obtained her PhD at the University of Cambridge and worked as a positive fellow at John Hopkins University at the United States Institute of Peace and the University of St. Andrews before becoming the director of the MA in Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of Manchester. Currently, her work is striving to connect scholarships on revolutions to peace and conflict studies, while also working on the project Blockage to Peace. Thank you, Sandra, for joining us. Next to, to Professor Marcus Allen, Marcus Allen Fajira is an associate professor in the Department of International Relations of the Federal University of, Som of Paraíba, uh, and currently on leave to develop research as visiting research fellow at the University of São Paulo. Also, he is a visiting professor at Manchester at a Masters in Social Development at the University of Nur, Bolivia. He holds a PhD in Political Science at the University, um, the, sta the State University of Campinas, Unicamp. He was a visiting research researcher at the University of Manchester at Uppsala University and the University of Vista, member of the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, Switzerland, and currently conducting research on the impacts of state and criminal violence on social peace in South America. Well, thank you, Marcus, for organizing also this event and being here with us. Without further ado, I'd like to pass the floor to Sandra and give her 30 minutes for her considerations and reflections. Sandra. Thank you. Thank you very much, Camilla, for this lovely introduction and for the invitation to speak to you today. So this um, is a great opportunity and always lovely to see Marcos, of course, as well. <laughs> um, so hi, everybody. What I would like to talk about is research that Oliver Richmond um, and I have been doing together with a colleague in Dublin. His name is Gesim Vizoka. So this is not only my own um, research that I'm presenting here, but it represents our joint research on a topic. And it was very much inspired by Oliver's recent book, which is now um, coming out within the next few months, um, where he has been researching how the international peace architecture came about. So this is basically, um, you've probably never heard this term before, but it's um, sort of an a composite term that encompasses all the different ways in which international actors and national actors are working together in order to support peace processes all over the world. So here we are thinking about peace diplomacy, um, all sorts of different aid initiatives, the interventions that you might all um, know a lot about, like peace building, peacekeeping, peacemaking. Um, so 
through the UN and other institutions, many of these initiatives are connected. And if we think about all these different connections, all these different ways how um, peace is jointly supported by different actors all over the world, then we come to understand that there's something like an international peace architecture at work. So Oliver wrote about this in this book um, that's called The Grand Design is coming out um, soon. But even though he could um, clearly identify the like um, the trajectory that has led us here, the different kind of influences that have shaped different layers of this architecture, he could also see that actually at the moment it's not working very well at all. We see, in fact, when we look around, we see more peace processes taking a step backwards, sort of collapsing either into conflict or into um, oppressive forms of rule, then we see them actually really succeeding and leading to reconciliation and moving from conflict um, towards peace uh, in a very sort of consistent way. So now the question was then for our current project that I'm representing here, the question is, how did we get there? How come that these, you know, billions of um, dollars that have been spent on, you know, all these interventions or trillions um, in all these different countries, in all these different types of initiatives have been um, so ineffective in the end? And so what I'm trying to do here is to ask the question first, um, whether there's maybe something that we've been overlooking all this time. So when we're looking at all the different ways in which this peace architecture is connected. Maybe we are overlooking that in the shadow of this peace architecture, there is something evolving. The kind of, you know, spoilers, the kind of negative side effects of policies that have gone wrong, um, structural types of violence, maybe all these um, different things that are blocking different blockages to peace processes are connected. Well, uh, Sandra told us he had a, um, a poor connection, so we're going to wait a bit until she can return. Or perhaps if we can wait just a, a bit more, and if not, Marcus, you can have the floor for some time. Okay, Marcus is <laughs> with you. Okay, Camila, many thanks. And <clears throat> we're really sorry that uh, Sandra has some connection issues, but she she told us that is trying to, to solve this. I think she's connecting again. Yes. Yeah. Sorry about Here that. She is. <laughs> Welcome again. <laughs> no, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. sorry. So I, I should have said we have a big problems with our internet connection and we have been having them for two days. They haven't been fixed. So I'm just hoping I can get through this um, presentation. Let's wait. <laughs> again. Okay, are we back on? Yeah? Yes. Oh, great. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, good. Let's give this another try. Um, I want to um, share um, something with you so that you can follow my um, that you can follow my presentation a bit more clearly because I'm now trying to present three different kind of models that we've been developing when we were thinking about different types of conflicts blocked in different types of ways and how these blockages maybe are connected. Um, okay, let me see. Okay, yes, so let's start with this. Okay, so um, I've already been telling you that the, can you see, can you see the slide here or not? Yes. Yeah, okay, that's great. Um, so I've already been telling you that the underlying question here um, in our research has been why is the international peace architecture ineffective? 
And so we've been breaking this question down into three further questions. The first one is about peace, process that, peace processes or peace interventions themselves. Have they maybe become captured um, in our um, attempt to sort of support peace processes? Have we given some sort of platform for spoilers to come in and capture these peace processes? The second question is, what kind of additional factors are blocking peace in the different patterns? And the third question is, are these different um, blockages connected in a way that we can see a system emerging there that we could call um, a proto-systemic counter-peace edifice? So um, what we've been trying to do to develop this research is actually um, to connect my research on um, revolutions and counter-revolutions with the idea of peace. So here we've been thinking that actually revolutions in a way have a similar kind of desire that peace processes have. They are very often progressive. They want to um, give greater scope to um, participation of civil society, of different actors that are groups of people in society that have been marginalized over a long period of time. And they want to sort of um, shift hierarchies in society towards more equality. And so in all of this, actually revolutions in a way resemble peace processes. So then we've been looking into the counter um, revolution literature. So how do counter revolutions work? If we now think that there's maybe something like a counter peace emerging, then what kind of um, assumptions can we draw on from the counter revolutions literature that helps us understand how these different blockages that we are looking at in any particular conflict context uh, may be connected with one another to, um, to create something more systemic in a way how a counter-revolution does. So um, in this attempt, we've been um, identifying three different patterns, which I would like to um, show you. Um, that's first the stalemate pattern. So these are kind of conflicts that um, have led to a stalemate. So here the conflict has moved from the battlefield into the realm of politics. So we had a peace agreement, like for example in Bosnia or like in Lebanon or other kind of Northern Ireland. Um, and we still have the same kind of conflict actors at work that are contesting each other. We still have the same kind of interests that are facing off against one another. But this kind of contestation has moved from the battlefield into, um, into the realm of diplomacy and parliamentary politics. But very often what we can see in the stalemate pattern, I'll go to it, um, I'll go to that more in detail later, we can see that um, actually the peace agreement that has been trying to sort of give enough scope to all the different conflict act actors to stop um, the overt violence, to stop the war, in that moment has over the long term then sort of put into place a, a different kind of pattern where they've all been carving out their own um, fiefdoms and actually the peace process is not moving forward, it's kind of stagnating in the position of a stalemate. So I'll talk about that stalemate pattern first, then the limited peace. So the idea of the limited peace is that we have quite a few countries in which you have areas of peace and then you have areas of conflict. And these could be all sorts of different um, types of conflict, sometimes very localized, um, as we see, for example, in countries in sub-Saharan Africa. I could name, for example, Nigeria as an example where parts of the country is at peace. And in other parts, you have, for example, different farming communities fighting one another. You have a succession um, conflict where, you know, the um, Igbo, for example, wanted to succeed from Nigeria and be their own kind of entity. And in addition to that, you also have an insurgency. Um, in this case, it's an Islamist insurgency. And so these different kind of conflicts are going on while the rest of the country is at peace. And I will explain how this pattern, the limited peace pattern, as we call it, is also maybe um, applicable to the conflicts that you can see in Latin America. But here it's not insurgencies and it's not succession movements. What we're talking about here is the kind of um, violence that Marcos, for example, will be telling you much more about in detail. The, the violence where, for example, criminal organizations are taking over 
um, favelas, you know, certain um, urban settings and are ruling them. So here we have then sometimes um, open sort of conflict zones in which, uh, you know, thousands of people die um, over the conflict, um, over the course of the conflict between the state and these kind of criminal gangs, and yet the rest of the country might be at peace. So it's kind of a limited peace in parts of the country, and then a counter peace in um, certain um, other parts of it. And as the last pattern, we have what we call the unmitigated counter peace. So these are, um, let's say, dictatorships. You can think about cases like Myanmar currently under the military um, junta or you know places in the Middle East, for example, where we have dictators from Syria, which is currently in a um, state of civil war against its um, own dictator or you know very oppressive forms of monarchical rule like Saudi Arabia, for example. So you have these forms of um, unmitigated counterpiece where basically no real um, civil society is, is possible. Um, and which very often actually lead to um, also violent responses against um, these harsh forms of oppression. So I'll talk about these patterns first and I'll identify, and this is again based on the literature on counter revolutions, that there's maybe an epicenter to all these different counterpiece um, formations. And this epicenter would be the same in all these different conflicts that we class into this particular pattern, whereas the other blockages that um, I'll show you later in a the graph, they might change from conflict to conflict. Um, and then I want to show you how these um, different conflict uh, patterns are maybe connected. Yeah, so, um, and another assumption that we got from the um, counter-revolutionary literature is that we also should pay attention to the question whether there could be a broader coalition between the kind of spoilers at the elite level, which have no interest in peace making any progress, could be connected to parts of the population, and we're, we'll be investigating in which ones of these patterns um, that would be a likely possibility. Okay, so the first pattern that I would like to show you here in the epicenter of it is what's called a formalized political unsettlement. So these are the stalemate conflicts that I um, talked about before. Um, in the stalemate, we have this idea that what we see on the surface is some form of stability. Like when you go to Bosnia, for example, or, you know, until last year when you went to um, Lebanon, for example, or to Northern Ireland, you would think it's right actually rather a stable place and the same is true for Cyprus for example where you know you don't have a peace agreement necessarily but you have um, a territorial division between two um, entities that have been fighting one another and this is um, an unrecognized kind of border so um, in all these kind of conflicts there is some form of surface stability but underneath the surface, and you know, this could be held, um, this sort of stability could have been created, as I said, by either a peace agreement or by a um, you know, territorial configuration where you, know, you have a, um, a split of the territory, like what you have in Kashmir, what you have in Cyprus, um, between the former conflict parties. But what is uh, similar or what's shared between all these different conflicts is that what's at the, at the epicenter, so whether that's you know the territorial configuration or whether that's the um, the peace agreement, um, is not um, is not uncontested. So this border would be contested between um, you know the north and the south of Cyprus, or you know in Kashmir the border is constantly sort of part to you know um, uh, there are constantly skirmishes from both sides. And the peace agreement in places like Bosnia, Lebanon, Northern Ireland, and so on, is in a way the same thing. So here, it's not the peace agreement itself that's constantly contested, but the different former warlords that have been given a position, a political role in this newly formed political entity, um, they are facing off against one another. And the peace agreement gives them the chance to do it. So this is what we call a formalized political unsettlement. This is not our um, expression, by the way. This comes from a um, from research from Jan Pospisil and Christine Bell, who have been looking into these kind of conflicts. And they've been saying, 
that in the case of uh, formalized political unsettlements, um, this conflict that has been moving from open war into um, a form of stability is constantly contested. And this is what we need to understand about this stalemate. It might look sort of stable on the surface, but underneath it can get very easily unraveled because there is no reconciliation. There is no further um, way for these former warlords to actually compromise with one another and come to a more stable form of peace. So what we then have is an, either an identity-based segregation as in Cyprus or these power sharing agreements which are contested by the different um, actors that are sharing power. And um, so this contestation continues the whole time. And we can currently see that in these kind of conflicts, there is a relapse actually very, um, it, it looks almost um, imminent. So we can see this happening, for example, in Bosnia. If you've been following the news there, there's one part of this multi-ethnic entity that now wants to split up and people are talking about civil war again. We've seen skirmishes on the streets between different um, religious groups again in Lebanon very recently. We've seen it again in Northern Ireland. So we can easily understand, and we know this also even from Cyprus, um, that in the buffer zone, there's, um, the buffer zone is contested from different sides, um, also in violent ways, um, uh, basically constantly without people taking much notice. We wait just a bit more. Well. Unfortunately, Sandra is having some problems with her connection, but we are going to wait. Uh, well, then I think Marcus. Let's start if she <laughs> come back, no? <laughs> Let's wait just some seconds. If she come back, then I can start. Well, um, I can see the chat for for the moment. But if we have any questions, Marcus, can you see the chat? Yes, I think by now there is no questions. Okay. What do you prefer, Camila? I begin. Ah, Sandra is back again. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. How long was I? When when did it stop? Can you tell me? Did I finish explaining the stalemate, or was I in the middle of it? I think I, I think that stopped when you was was concluding. Okay. Okay. That's good. Um, that's good because. Um, the problem with this platform here seems to be that I can't even see whether I'm still online. So I'm looking at my own um, slide. And uh, then when okay. I wanted to change it, that's when I realized that I was actually already gone. Okay. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good. Problem. So then let's let's assume we're now talking about the next um, pattern. Okay. Um, try. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, so that was the pattern that I've just explained. Now, the next pattern um, that I would like to to show you is the um, the limited counterpiece. Sorry, 
that's this one here. So the limited piece pattern is one where um, where we can see that the um, oh this is not okay. So in the um, in the limited piece pattern here we have um, at the um, in the center of it a dysfunctional kind of captured state. Um, so here we're thinking about very often post-colonial states where the state model has been imported through um, colonialism, for example, and it never quite fit the requirements of the society where it's been implemented. So um, then different you know, elites over time after independence have tried to make it more stable or more meaningful for people. But very often what we can see is that this... Um, that the the state um, has over time invested more in its like very often because we're looking at states where there isn't so much um, to you know so many resources to redistribute and because of this uh, we're we're looking at a state which um, you know the Africanist literature calls a quasi state in which the state apparatus seems to be existing very much in the capital city, but the further you go into the countryside, the less you find of the state that can actually provide some form of infrastructure to people. And so the state isn't particularly meaningful for many people. And over the, um, so this leaves a lot of space for people to compete in other ways over, let's say, farmland and over other kind of um, resources that communities are um, competing over. So this leaves space for these um, other kind of blockages that here are on the side with the red arrows, if you can see this. So for example, um, it gives space for resources to be exploited by um, foreign companies and um, this resource exploitation to become militarized over the course of time. So you can, for example, think about the um, the, the current debates over cobalt mining in Africa. You know, cobalt is this kind of resource that no one has really paid much attention to, except for people who are, you know, very much involved with the environmental lobby, because it's now becoming very important as a mineral in these kind of um, uh, electric cars that, you know, we are all supposed to drive in the near future. And so apparently the DRC has one of the big cobalt mines um, in in the world. Um, it's the resource there's being exploited currently by the Chinese. But if you want to um, expropriate something like that, even if you strike a deal, of course, with the state, there's of course only a limited amount of the revenues that actually go into the developing state and um, the rest of the proceeds go to the, the country that's having control over these mines. So what this often leads to is uh, a militarization of um, resource exploitation. So to shore up you know, your interest in these resources, you actually have to send mercenaries to guard the mines and to guard these resources. And over this very often conflicts occur with the local communities that are saying, you're exploiting our resources and we're getting nothing out of this extractivism. So that's one of the um, reasons why conflicts um, are starting in, in countries with such resources. Otherwise, ones might be spillovers from um, regional conflicts. So here we can see that, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, where you know the colonial rulers were defining the rules with rulers on a map, uh, very often the borders that came out of it are actually indefensible. So um, tribes are living across borders. There are you know, all sorts of intercommunal conflicts and conflicts can very often spill over from one country into the next. That's another source of um, conflict in, in this limited peace pattern. And in response to this, we have counterinsurgency. So we have, um, you know, whenever we see insurgencies arriving from any one of these, um, um, out of these reasons that I've just mentioned, or other reasons, ideological ones, for example, as in the um, jihadist counterinsurgency currently in, in, in the Sahel, then what we can see is that there's uh, a counterinsurgency as a response. And this counterinsurgency again makes the state even more unpopular because the way how people are experiencing the state is only through, um, you know, um, 
the military basically coming in and trying to pacify the area. And in this way, it might be there might be something similar to what you can see to the militarized response to criminal gangs in the favelas, where you know people then don't really know anymore who they should support because they are basically caught in the crossfire of you know both the criminal gangs and the state that's sort of cracking down on them. And um, so you know this is a conflict context that kind of draws in um, all sorts of populations that. Um, you know, shouldn't be affected by it. And state building is unfortunately another one of those interventions that have turned out to fuel these conflicts even more. Because what we know from research into peace, uh, state building is that here there's not a state being built that um, re redistributes resources, but one where the police is supposed to get stronger and where there's more investment into military and you know, the whole security apparatus. So again, the state is becoming more oppressive as a result. So this, all the dysfunctions of the state in a way get amplified. And this can then very easily turn into um, our next pattern, which is then a fierce state. So if you think about the state, you know, which, um, you know, 50 years ago was sort of the great hope for people after colonialism ended and so on, then it became captured very often by authoritarian elites. And these are now becoming stronger through this process of counterinsurgency because here foreign powers too are now supporting them with the kind of rationality in mind that while it's better to oppress, you know, the terrorists or the insurgencies, um, then, you know, to, uh, to um, give some red lines to these authoritarian rulers in these countries. So they see them as allies. The international community often sees authoritarian rulers as allies against these forms of um, insurgency, and that makes them even stronger. So their dictatorships then become even more fierce over time. And when I have this um, image of the fierce state there, what that means is, so this is now a context in which you have no civil society that operates effectively at all anymore. So these are places like, you know, Syria under um, the Assad regime, um, or actually also, you know, um, Saudi Arabia or Iran, there's no civil society to speak of there um, that has any sort of meaningful place. So you have the state um, ruling society by very oppressive kind of means, but not being able to otherwise um, influence society in a in a more sort of peaceful way, and the outcome of that is is either continued oppression or it's revolution against the fierce state. But there aren't many other options. And what makes this competition sort of worse, or the, what makes the fierce state and the conflict between society and the um, the the state worse, is the geopolitical influences. As I said, when um, external actors are trying to strengthen these authoritarian regimes for the sake of the war on terror, for example, um, but also elite alliances between autocrats. Now, this is something that we've currently seen happening in a lot of places, especially in the Middle East, where one autocrat is helping another one to stay in power militarily and so on. Um, and um, yeah, then we also have um, the principle of non-intervention, for example, um, which is, you know, one of the fundamental principles in the UN system, which also gives cover to authoritarian states that basically they can treat their population any way they like until the international community wakes up and says at some point, no, you know, we have to intervene in this. But until this point, um, authoritarian regimes are given cover by the principle of non-intervention. So um, just to come back now to conclusions very quickly. Um, what we conclude from this is we can see that these patterns, they do seem to cover quite a few different conflicts. And, you know, if anyone is interested in sort of, you know, um, getting a stronger understanding which ones I'm counting into which pattern, then we can discuss this later. Um, but since we can see them in different parts of the world and that these conflict patterns remaining rather stable, what we understand at this point is that um, the different kind of blockages must be connected. If they were completely unconnected, there wouldn't be, wouldn't be such stable patterns that we can trace um, through different regions. So um, at the very least, we can say that they're probably proto-systemic at this point. What we cannot say um, 
you know, quite at this point because we need to research this a bit better, is in, in how far these connections are actually stable over time. We can see that um, the, the populations are actually probably only through nationalism um, sort of being brought, brought into this kind of conflict framework and supporting the counter-peace elites only in the stalemate pattern. We do not see this in the dysfunctional state or in the um, a limited peace pattern and we certainly don't see it in the repressive setup of the um, of the unmitigated counterpiece. So the population is trying to stay out of it as much as they can, as much as they can take sides without risking their lives at all, which isn't always the case. Um, but we can see that the elites are, are currently getting stronger, the counterpiece elites, in their attempts to um, support one another. And we can also see that um, structural violence is playing into um, into the hands of this as well. Okay, so um, thank you very much for your attention. That's basically all my reflections at this point, and I don't want to take away any further from Marcos's talk now. Thank you, Sandra. Then Marcos. Uh, many thanks, uh, Sandra and Camila. And I just ask please to share my my slides. Many thanks, Thiago. Uh, uh, what I would like to present here uh, is uh, we can say that a case study trying to apply this concept of blockage to peace. As Sandra told, uh, is a concept in evolution they are building, but I, uh, Oliver Richman and me, and wrote this article that was published recently in Journal of Intervention in State Building, in which we reflect on um, how the criminal governance in Latin America works as a blockage to, to peace. No? And as Sandra mentioned, that we can note, uh, we can notice in this case um, a quite clear case of limited peace in, in Brazil, Colombia, El Salvador, countries that uh, suffer because the criminal governance that makes peace more far from the population in general. So and in, the, in this uh, research, we had as objective to examine how criminal governance creates some blockage to peace, and especially against peace formation in urban space of Latin America, uh, in which in our understanding uh, are approaching the scale of violence present in civil wars. Just remember that, for example, Brazil has annually uh, that toll of 60,000 people that kill it. And most of these people linked, uh, are killed, linked to, to conflict in, between gangs or between the states and gangs and even and police violence in favelas and, and poor areas in Brazil in general. You know? So uh, it's, it's, it's sad to say that the, the numbers that we witness in Latin America is quite um, similar of conflict zones in, in place that, that is suffering a civil war or other, other case of civil war. So in, in the paper, we show that criminal governance undermines the process of peace formation uh, supported by civil society in two ways. First, maintain levels of violence and also exploiting cultural and structural violence, but also pushing the state away from citizens. So um, we, we try to show in this, in this discussion, in this research paper, that uh, it's more difficult to civil society uh, form peace and uh, because this criminal governance, no? they create a, a kind of block blockage in this way. And also, as we will see in the next slides, because the criminal governance and exploit also the several kinds of violence, not only direct violence, but also structural and cultural violence, as we show. And the, and the paper has uh, as contributions. And first, uh, showing that the gravity of criminal governance do not obscure the possibilities for creating a more peaceful environment and by relatively marginal peace formation process. But also, and uh, reflecting on this concept uh, on peace formation, you know, that how um, civil society and local agents can work even in a context in which criminal governance serves a, serves a blockage to peace. 
And we show also that local agency has potentially the competence, knowledge, and legitimacy to begin dealing with the challenging scenario of urban and criminal violence, even if only initially in discursive terms. What we mean here, you know, that the local, and when we think about the urban areas in Brazil and also other parts of Latin America, and has all the potential to deal with this blockage to peace, that's the criminal governance, but and they have um, not the, the power to change the scenario, the structural scenario in particular. No? So in discursive terms, they can change the, the setting, but of course, they do not have uh, the power and, and the, the role of the state is also clear and important here in particular. So just to share here what was the structure of this research no, um, that I am presenting here today. Um, we we do in this in, in this initial discussion uh, uh, a reflection, a literature review about peace studies and criminal violence. And we think that this is an advancement also in the agenda of peace studies, because in general, and peace studies is very connected with the conflict that affects the state. And the criminal violence sometimes is not so examined because uh, there is a perception that the criminal violence is linked to economic objectives and not political objectives in general no? or, or political aims. And then, then we try to show that the criminal violence is also an important aspect that needs to be regarded when we think in contexts like, like Latin America and also places in which the criminal violence are strong, like South Africa, for example. In the third uh, section of the paper, we discuss the criminal governance in Latin America and its blockage for social peace, in which and we, uh, we discuss first how criminal governance dynamics in the state works, and second, how the criminal governance maintains advantage and reproduces cultural and structural violence. And the, in, this, in, the, in the last part of the paper, we discuss the opportunities for the locals, for peace farmers, in settings of criminal violence. So, um, first, of th uh, first of all, it's important to, to reflect that peace studies uh, and criminal violence has a clear link that sometimes is not well explored in the literature. And as we, we, we see it in the paper, where the state's monopoly of violence fails to provide the basic needs of the citizens in terms of physical protection, human dignity, and social security, mostly in areas with high levels of structural violence, there is an increased possibility of the emergence of areas that are not governed by the state. In such settings, criminal organizations have the capacity to create norms and rules, provide security, service, and raise taxes in the territories under their control, forming new frameworks of authority and domination for a given population, whilst boost, uh, boosting their profits. And so, what we see, and this is not new in the literature, there are other people discussing this, like, like Benjamin Lessing, Graham Daniel Willis, and other um, academics that is dedicated to understand uh, criminal governance, is that when the state fails to provide the basic for the, the people in general, there, there is an open room for the criminal uh, uh, actors create norms and governance. And then the criminal actors not only works to govern, uh, to create governance and for an economic illicit activity like cocaine trafficking, for example, that's quite clear in South America, but they uh, create norms and, and, and social rules to control areas that are strategic to the business and of, uh, of the gang in particular. You know? So not, it's not necessarily a political objective that we see in the criminal actors, in countries like Brazil, but they work in a way in which uh, they uh, they clearly uh, affect the, the social peace in particular. No? Um, also, uh, and another uh, important discussion when we talk about the criminal governance is when we are uh, when we are talking, how uh, is the evolution of this criminal governance? 
we see in general that the criminal governance starts with the internal governance of a criminal gang. Uh, this is quite clear, for example, in the case of Primeiro Comando da Capital or Comando Vermelho in Brazil, in which in the first steps to create rules to the functioning of the criminal organization in particular. But then when advanced to criminal market, they try not only to control and create norms for the participants of the gang, but also to control the business, to control the market in general. No? And this is uh, uh, quite clear also. And, but the, what we our main concern in the paper is when we are talking about criminal civilian governance or gang rule, is when not only the criminal governance works to, to manage a business, but also creating and imposing norms and, and for the people that work in, that lives in a, in a given social, in a given area. No? Um, I think that this uh, graffiti is, is quite um, uh, interesting to think what we mean when we talk about criminal governance as gang rule. This is a graffiti in the city of João Pessoa, the city where I live. Uh, in which one of the criminal gangs that control um, some uh, poor areas and favelas here in the city and put this graffiti in which is uh, clearly written um, the rules that works in these areas. So we see here, do not use drugs in front of the kids and do not steal in the favelas and so on. So um, the criminal gang um, advanced to reach um, this particular um, kind of governance in which they impose also normals to civilians, civilians to, but of course to control also the criminal market. And then how does this affect peace? You know, how is, uh, why we are talking about criminal governance and how this connects with peace in particular? What we argue in this paper is that and criminal governance creates two main blockages to peace formation, to, to build uh, a peace in a, in a context of limited peace, as we see in Brazil. Um, first, that the criminal legitimacy pushes the state away from citizens. It is significantly advanced because of the vacuum or negligence of states' public policies in poor areas. So, and of course, when the, when the criminal uh, legitimacy pushes the state away, this affects the, uh, the, the offering of public services in an in a area that in general demands more um, public service because you are talking about the private areas. But also another important blockage is that criminal governance sometimes can seem uh, as positive for the people, but... Uh, even because, for example, they offer small services like um, to pay, for example, a medicine for a, a mother that needs in, uh, that a kid is, is, is ill and so on. But the, uh, a topic that's important to reflect is that the criminal governance structures do not reduce this in uh, social injustice, this structural violence that we see in favelas. Uh, actually is the opposite. They take advantage of a setting of inequality. We can see, for example, the youth you know, that, is, that are engaged in criminal gangs uh, that could have a, a better um, perspective of life, but in general, uh, they work like a, a, a company, a, a capitalist company in general. They hire these youth to work in the illicit business. So there is a reproduction of this structural violence by criminal um, organizations that make more difficult to create peace in these settings. But in this context, we also reflect which opportunities are open to peace formers, which opportunities are open to civil society, local actors, to deal in a context in, in which they state some, uh, as Sandra mentioned, uh, is open only arrive in, uh, in these areas uh, with repression and not with public policies, but also the criminal governance uh, that seems positive, not only is positive. And two opportunities that we identified, the first is to foster dialogue between political actors and civil society to address the root of social violence. And the second opportunity is promoting inclusive initiatives 
and, and trying to provide alternative forms of political and socioeconomic practices against direct and structural violence. And we identified in the research some example of the practice in which there is a fostering of the dialogue between political actors and civil society, and but also the promotion of inclusive initiatives, as we show some of these examples in the next slide. For example, uh, an example of the of an initiative that tries to create the connection between political actors uh, and the civil society is the NGO Rio de Paz, for example, in Rio de Janeiro. They work. Um, uh, with a cooperation with the Department of Public Information of the United Nations. And why this? No, um, the, public, the Department of Public Information of the United Nations uh, find that it was not necessarily reliable, the data sent by some, a Rio de Janeiro state. And Rio de Paz would like also to provide data that would be useful to, to think policies to deal with the violence of the city. And then Rio de Paz proposed to the uh, an agreement to the Department of Public Information to exchange the data on homicides and the violence in general. And then we have a, 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 a unique initiative in which a local actor, uh, an NGO in, in this particular case, has a cooperation with a political actor that the United Nations to deal with this problem of the statistics and data connected to violence. But also we can find an, another initiatives uh, supported by civil society by this or or what i mean the the peace formation and in which they try to deal with the criminal governance as a blockage to peace an important initiative that i mentioned for example is the project universidade ação in João pessoa for example that's conducted by the by the friend paulo kuman he's a, a professor in the state university of paraiba in which uh, he engaged students and adolescents and teenagers in general in violent neighborhoods. And in using arts, they try to show that not, uh, not necessarily the teens need to be engaged with a criminal organization. They, can, they, can, uh, they have other options in their lives that's not only to be engaged uh, in, a, in a gang or another gang. It's interesting that, that this project is spinning over to other universities, the university where I work, the Universidade Federal da Paraíba, but also the Universidade Federal de Sergipe has similar projects in which uh, it's like a outreach project from this, from this university and trying to engage uh, the students, especially in, in international relations, uh, in, uh, in the arts to 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 deal with the criminal governance and but fostering this alternative practice and to dealing with the youth in particular and another example that i'd like to share is the fundaec in colombia in near cali region they have uh more in for more than a decade a program that's supporting community leaders program in which they work especially in these areas that's controlled by the criminals uh, by criminal organizations the bandas criminales in colombia and try to to engage the youth um, in a leadership program but not a leadership like um, like we see in general in in management courses uh, in, in the idea that they need to be a leader a coach for a company but a leadership connected with the, a social leadership how can work to the society where they where they live? And not only important they engage a leadership for himself, but a leadership for the uh, the population where they 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 live in particular. And that, and we think that's also interesting and uh, initiative that came from the uh, from peace farmers to deal with this criminal governance in in uh, especially near Puerto Tejada in a city. Uh, near Cali, in which the criminal governance is very strong in, in this area in particular. So, and the final remarks here, and just to conclude and to, to hear some questions or comments from if you have. And uh, Oliver Richmond and me and not said in this research that local agency has potentially the competence, knowledge and attitudes to begin dealing with criminal governance and state violence, but its power and capacity to affect a structural, train, a structural change and criminal violence, economic injustice, and paramilitary state activity 
is negligible in direct terms. So is some an um, initiative that we see in some in some places, but uh, this peace formation initiatives, as we mentioned here, need must be fostered and translated also in political action, connecting connecting civil society organizations, the state, and also the donors to reconstruct a legitimate political order. And in Latin America, we have a challenge in particular because the peace architecture, uh, li the liberal peace architecture, do not seem, for example, the problem of criminal governance or criminal gangs, a problem that uh, international organizations needed to deal with. So it's another um, challenge in, in for all, everyone that's researching peace research is to think how can we advance in this agenda and to think um, context in, in which we have a strong uh, armed um, violence, social violence, but not, uh, but that not fit to the liberal peace architecture. Also, the political order runs the risk of serial dest destabilization because of the state's displacement and potentially collusion with criminal governance, as we see, for example, in the case of militias in Rio de Janeiro. And um, this research also opened avenues for new research that we identified also. Uh, that's uh, some of these issues I'm trying to, to move in my research agenda. No? First, for example, is the state violence also as a blockage to peace in areas of urban violence, as we see in Brazil, especially in the connection between militias and the state. Also, another topic also connected for the, the issue of the militias is the collusion between state and criminal violence as a blockage to peace. And the last one is the, the topic that I'm that are currently more engaged is the youth agency to overcome this criminal violence or how this youth agency can work to deal with this blockage to peace that's the criminal governance and criminal violence so many thanks um, camila and i conclude here my presentation thank you marcos thank you professor sandra as well uh, I think we have uh, an engaging discussion and a few questions already on the chat, so I'll go directly to them and then also one of my own. Um, this is from Roberta. I'm not sure I understood how you see the role of, well, we can see here, uh, of the International Peace Institute in this scenario. Is it specific action that needs to be taken internationally to address this? Or is uh, international action a cause driver of these patterns? Also, when I think of several countries that have come out of protracted violent conflict and the limitations of peace, I immediately think of historical patterns, especially colonialism and prolonged effort. Do you address this in your discussion, Sandra? Mm -hmm. Hi, Roberta. <laughs> nice to see you again. Um, so the, uh, the the question of the international peace architecture, it's um, in one of the patterns, the one with this, the stalemate pattern where the formalized political um, unsettlement is in the epicenter of the conflict. Um, there, yes, that's a captured peace process. In many of the others, it's more actually um, interventions that are geared towards stabilization, not really towards peace. But this also seems to be where the international peace architecture at the moment is leaning, that there's um, you know, a greater investment in trying to pacify certain regions than there is in sort of building them up economically, you know, making um, the state stronger in its infrastructure and so on. And there's much more investment in um, increasing the coercive capacity of the state. So this is what we see. And then when it comes to history, yes, especially in the um, limited peace pattern, there we are going very much into the history of, um, you know, how colonial powers are kind of setting up the state as a dysfunctional entity that, you know, some of the post-colonial leaders have been trying to rescue in different ways. Um, but haven't really been able to achieve it. So here we can see forms of um, economic inequality, for example, that are still um, perpetuated after independence and that are kind of leaving these states in this kind of economic 
economically dependent um, and, and and in some way volatile situation with a lot of inequality. So um, we're looking into history, but because we are um, we're trying to create patterns here, we can't really look into the, the history of like one particular conflict country and you know to write a history of like a group of countries um, is always a difficult thing, except if we are, you know, directly talking about, let's say, the post-colonial state and its um, deficiencies, then, you know, we can draw on history in this kind of cumulative way, but otherwise one has to be a bit careful not to um, generalize historic situations too much until you get, you know, until you start applying these kind of patterns to one particular conflict and then you can bring in all the history that we know about the place but otherwise you know it can easily lead to over generalization as well so does that answer your question thank you sandra marcus would you like to comment on this as well no i think okay, sandra, okay. I <laughs> then i i do have one question of my own as well uh, for both of you, actually, but first for Sandra. Sandra, I was very interested in the concept of counterpiece, and actually already um, am very interested in how how it's uh, designed the the idea of blockage to peace, and at the very center of both counter uh, both concepts are uh, one idea of peace. Blockage to peace uh, means that there is uh, a peace to be a peace to be met, right? Uh, to arrive and uh, counter peace. Uh, as I understood, I don't know. I actually this could be one of the questions as well. Uh, seems to me like a, a, an alternative to that, to that uh, version of peace. So another idea of peace, and what comes. Uh, what I can understand and what comes from this encounter of uh, one time, one form of peace, one peace, and this uh, counter peace is, uh, well, the friction is ongoing conflict. And, uh, it, and in my understanding, this actually uh, creates the idea that some academics have already promoted of a permanent crisis. But actually, we see that there are blockages. So that might, uh, there must be some some tools of dealing with this. And what I wanted to ask um, you and Marcus as well, if he wants to answer, at what tools would be best met uh, this kind of problem? And um, well, for Marcus, I also would like to ask if criminal governance actually comes as uh, well. You you mentioned as a blockage piece, but would it come uh, at some point become a counterpiece as well, an idea of counterpiece? So I would like to ask both of you this. Thank you, Camilla. Um, so it's not, not that easy to answer. I think you've um, understood the concept um, correctly. So what we are talking about are different types of conflict that we can see in in these three different patterns. Some of them are openly, um, like there's open hostility. In others, it's a conflict that's sort of more under the surface and is currently more fought with diplomatic means, but it still persists. It's still the same kind of, like in Bosnia and Lebanon and so on, it's still the same conflict between the same groups, just now taken to, into a different kind of sphere. Um, in, in other cases, in these other two patterns, there the conflict is much more um, directly out in the open. And um, when you talk about, you know, whether this is sort of what other people have been um, speaking of as in like perennial crisis, then this may in certain ways overlap, but it's also not exactly the same because what we are trying to do is really to find out how, um, different types of sometimes negative side effects of um, the international peace architecture, sometimes completely new factors, like also environmental degradation that I didn't talk about much at the moment, um, are causing new conflicts. Um, if you put that on top of, you know, all the existing kind of conflict lines within society already, where you have you know, sort of clashes between identity groups and, and all of this. So um, that's why your question is, 
very hard to answer, you know, what kind of tools we, we can apply. What we do understand, I think, at this point is that many of the tools that the international peace architecture has developed, like, for example, peacemaking with mediation at its center, um, hasn't been effective in the kind of complex civil wars in particular that we can currently see. I mean, if you follow the whole um, the whole mediation process in places like Syria, for example, it made no progress until, you know, then Russia came in, it took over, you know, not only the military side of things, but actually also the peacemaking side of it. And now it's all heading towards basically um, re-establishing this, you know, dictator Bashar al-Assad in, in Syria and so on. So we can see many of these instruments, not only mediation, but also peace building um, and peacekeeping, they have just not been able to really um, deal with many of the underlying factors. So we thought that maybe over time there would be more development, more democratization, but all these tools have somehow been emptied out or they haven't been effective. So what we can see is that currently the tools that we know of, they are not working very well. So we can, you know, clearly see that, you know, peace building isn't necessarily creating stable states. Actually, we have more research now suggesting that peace building um, at one point or another plays into the hands of, you know, these um, authoritarian forms of rule that come out of it much more, that's a much greater um, sort of likelihood for um, peace building to create authoritarian forms of rule than it is actually to create democracies, for example. So we, we know that the tools that we have been researching for a long period of time are, are failing, but we do not know at this point um, how we can design new instruments that are better suited. But I can tell you one thing which becomes more and more clear, and no one, of course, wants to hear it, but many of these conflicts, they have to do with forms of inequality that the states in themselves cannot solve. And they cannot solve it not only because they don't have the infrastructure, but they also cannot solve it because this structural violence is vested in the international system. So the only real solution to um, these kind of conflicts that are now coming out of environmental degradation, out of inequality, out of like, you know, very severe forms of poverty would be some global forms of um, redistribution that, you know, would lift people out of these kind of situations so that they don't have to fight their, you know, neighboring village over something, but, you know, where some form of more um, sustainable um, development can be found. And to finance that, it, very often the post-colonial states are simply not in a position. They do not have the resources. So if it's not coming from the global north, then we are really just only putting, you know, sort of a patches on, on um, you know, a pattern that's globally really quite becoming quite visible. Does that answer? Mila, many thanks for the question. Um, is, uh, what you, you're asking is something that I am trying also to, to advance and to reflect, you know, because my, in my perspective, and um, uh, first of all, to think if the, the criminal governance is a blockage to peace, a counter peace, it's important to define what we mean about peace. No? And if we mean peace just as, um, as the, the absence of that or reduction of direct violence, and the criminal governance can work as the opposite, as uh, the, the creation of peace. No? As some um, colleagues from criminology are uh, advancing this research in uh, in Brazil, you no, know, showing that, uh, for example, in areas in which Primeiro Comanda Capital dominate, we see the end of direct violence sometimes, the end of the uh, homicides or the the decreasing of the uh, the some kinds of violence like rape and so on. But I think, in my uh, in my view, that it would be interesting if we regard the peace in a in a in as we see in the classic studies of peace, uh, in the peace studies, that not only is the direct violence, but also the structural violence. And in this particular, as I mentioned it in my presentation, and I think that the criminal governance also works as counter peace because they reproduce the cultural and the structural violence. Uh, the, the system of patriarchy, uh, 
patriarchy that we'll see in the criminal organizations in that the woman has no space or has no um, voice in general. No, this is in general a, a discussion of how to manage uh, uh, an economically illicit business in general or how they use the youth to work for the business in particular so it can work as a, a counterpiece if we think uh, uh, a concept of peace that's not only the, the the reduction of direct violence but also structural violence but as mentioned and i'm sharing with you just some reflection because it's something that i'm trying to build on also and Maybe, I don't know, in our future paper that we are trying to, to think about local actors, we can manage this, this discussion also. Yes, yes, Marx, definitely. I hope this discussion comes up. Uh, and, uh, well, it is, it is a point that we have to make because the pandemic showed us that there is a lot of... Uh, room to debate the the role of criminal governance in our current states particularly in latin america well we have another question um marcel suarez good morning to all from rio so many thanks for the quite an interesting debate i'd like to ask you about the impact of unequal political social and economic conditions as blockades to peace well, I think this question uh, both of you can can address. Sandra? Uh, yes, so um, we can definitely see that inequality, and that means political inequality just as much as material inequality or um, the kinds of inequality that come out of, for example, um, discrimination against certain groups based on their gender and so on is clearly a part of these um, of the patterns that we are investigating. Um, it is more important for my research in the in the two patterns that are called you know the limited counterpiece and the unmitigated counterpiece than in the other one because there we have sort of a, in the stalemate pattern we have a um, an official recognition at least of you know the different former conflict parties as sort of um, similarly endowed with, you know, rights and, and so on. Um, what we have there is then still discrimination on the base of um, class and on the base of gender, but very often not on the basis of other identity factors. So we are looking into all of these um, things and they are important. Um, one always has to be a bit careful. Of course, we don't know a single society anywhere on the planet that's, you know, perfectly equal or, you know, um, that has perfect equality, not only in terms of rights, but materially um, between, you know, everybody and society. And yet we have more or less peaceful societies. So um, a certain degree of um, inequality is probably something that a society can cope with. It, it, but there's, you know, no question that it becomes a problem for peace and conflict once it's directed towards certain groups in particular. Um, and that's, you know, then very often where um, sort of claims and sometimes violence then arise in response to it. Is that answering your question? Mark. Mark. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you, Marcial, for the for the question. I think that's a very important aspect, especially when we regard context like we see in Latin America, no? because the uh, in, in particular the criminal gangs and also the guerrilla groups in cases like we see in Colombia take advantage sometimes of these political, social, and economic conditions to advance. And some and often they they have also some reason to do that because they state do not deal with these problems in our region. No? And this is not only an important variable to consider as a blockage to peace in Latin America, but also when we see other contexts like Nigeria, for example. Recently, I was um, uh, writing a, a paper with a colleague about the how the Boko Haram take advantage of the the envir environmental problems in Lake Chad, for example, and the economic conditions in the countryside in the near of the of the border with Chad, 
and it's quite clear how the group advances also because this unequal political, social, and economic conditions that we see and uh, is intrinsically connected with the Lake Chad problem, you know, all the environmental problems. And this, um, and so I, I understand that, yes, there is a, a, an impact of, in, in, especially when we see that the, the actors that conduct a, a violent conflict and as are aware of these uh, these conditions and to to try to advance the, their agendas in particular and this um, uh, is clear not only in latin america but in other places also thank you myself for the question thank you and uh well i have another question it's not actually a question it's more a comment because i i really enjoyed your answers and I would like to comment a bit on them, um, particularly when Sandra says the tools we have are not working very well. And well, we still need to design new tools, but that's very difficult. And uh, well, we can see that uh, for the whole uh, presentation, that the blockades to peace are coming up almost uh, with very innovative ways of uh, creating a trouble for our already very much afflicted societies. So um, this seems to me that there is um, much to be addressed in terms of how, why so many blockages are coming up and why we still haven't designed new tools to address them. And uh, in, my, in my experience, going to the field, uh, and talking with different actors, what I can see is very uh, much a dis disconnection between the levels where peace is being uh, developed, peace is being planned, and who is actually uh, creating these ideas of how to counteract this counter peace, uh, this counter peace activity, and um, the very grassroots of uh, um, network projects, uh, civil society engagement with uh, indigenous groups. These are, are all working in the field, but there is no uh, plan to address them and make them uh, well uh, effective as a as a long term plan. And well, these disconnections in at the field seems to me that is also a blockage, but it's um, a strategic blockage because it doesn't seem there is any political intention to solve this. I, I don't see, we know the gap, we see the gap all the time, but I don't see any activity uh, aiming to fill this gap. And I believe the academic has uh, tried to do so and has a room, uh, has a, a role to, to to do this, to fill this gap with this talk or, you know, projects such as the ones Marcus uh, mentioned, we have this uh, this space and, and this space now. Although in Brazil, I would say that uh, this space is closing a bit. So we, we still have <laughs> to face that. And Latin America as a role has to face rising blockages in terms of authoritarianism, um, political and social violence, and these forms of violence, structural violence at, at the macro level and the micro level as well, has uh, created quite a, a problem for the the citizens. And I actually was thinking about how we connected with uh, other actors, other members of the academy who are working at their own fields, like uh, those specialized in public security and citizen security that are promoting some things that are interested in this debate, but we don't talk. And well, I, I wanted to uh, ask, your, ask your reflections on these comments as well. And well, ask you to some closing remarks for uh, we are coming up in the time and well, the, the debate should continue even further, but perhaps in another event next year. 
Excellent. Um, thank you very much, Camilla. Can I go first, or, I, or Marcos, do you want to go first? Yeah. Go um, ahead, Camilla. I, I think you are spot on with this, Camilla. I um, I do not see any sort of political will in you know wider participation beyond you know these kind of like workshops and you know training and you know these kind of hypocritical concepts of um, ownership and so on. But I think we also have to understand here that if we think about the international peace architecture, as Oliver calls it, um, when it started emerging, it was kind of, it was coming from the global north and it was meant to only manage conflicts. It was never meant to resolve them. Then over time, many people in the global north started understanding that, um, you know, this problem with refugee um, streams coming our way and so on, is never going to end if we don't do something that's a bit more than just you know closing off borders or you know trying to keep people in their conflict affected territories or uh, try to keep you know buffer zones between people who are fighting one another. So um, our under the sort of the, they were forced into this position to expand a bit, but they've never done it fully, and I don't think they've done it ideologically either. These are small concessions that we can see, and this is why it's not particularly meaningful. But in my opinion. The one way how um, this can be pushed is actually when these kind of small groups that we can all see in our fieldwork are actually organizing something bit bigger, you know, something more transnational. If, if I sort of, you know, I'm working on revolutions and in my opinion, the reason why revolutions are currently not going anywhere is they're still contesting the state and the state is dysfunctional. It's been, you know, sort of, it's been occupied um, by these interests that basically do not want to share, they do not want to open up, they do not actually want to create the kind of equality that society might need to be permanently stable. So if we understand that, then the push has to come in a much more forceful way than you know small kind of you know tiny little social movements or like tiny little peace initiatives. All of this has to come from the big initiatives that we are currently seeing, and we see many of them. We see indigenous movements that are you know, coming together with other, for example, um, climate change movements for the same kind of causes that are coming together with you know, anti-racist kind of um, initiatives. You know, not only Black Lives Matter, but you know, different types of um, recognition that you know, there's a uh, a color divide in you know between the global north and the global south and and all of this. So if we see these different initiatives connecting with one another, then maybe some um, some stronger pressure can be applied that's actually forcing the international peace architecture to develop new tools. Because as I said, you know this global resource sharing, it's not coming out of the you know will or the good heart of you know anyone in the global north. It it has to come through pressure. So the the question is, how can this pressure be created? Does it need, for example, a new ideology? Um, you know, now that all our old ideologies have proven, you know, rather sort of useless. Oliver and I we were discussing this last night in the in a different kind of um, setting whether maybe ideology is something that would have to respond to our new understanding of power. Now, if we understand power to be intersectional, you know, coming from all these different sort of layers at the same time, do we need an, an ideology that's responding to it to mobilize people around it so that more systemic pressure can be applied on the institutions? It's my question, but we would probably have to see it in order for change to occur within the international peace architecture. Marcos? And um, interesting comments, Camila, that you shared, and and I I think uh, similar to Sandra, you know that unfortunately we see the the rising of some challenges to peace in general, blockages to peace, if you want, uh, and this is not only um, a problem that we see in Latin America, but in general. For example, the rise of nationalism, the the closing border to migrants, and so on. But as, as mentioned at Sandra, I think that um, some responses is not um, offered by the state, but the civil society in general is trying to show us uh, as academics or as citizens in general that some, um, that some uh, responses can uh, need to be organized and, and 
do more pressure pressure to the state to deal with you no know, to to decrease the 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 influence of this blockage that that politically we see very strong and also uh, with the pandemic i think that another problem that we can we, that in Brazil is quite uh, evident. You see this in the streets. It's also the inequality. You know, that I think that's a huge uh, blockage to peace and, and will serve as counter peace also in a medium and short and all, maybe long term also. You know, that, that That is quite clear in, in Global South and we see this very clear in the streets. So many thanks for the, for the uh, amazing discussion. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Well, uh, thank you very much, Camila. <laughs> thank you, thank you both. Uh, we have one last question, and I would do so very fastly. It's from Marilia. How do you see the regional level of analysis as a possible tool for decreasing blockage to peace? And thank you for this incredible panel. Well, just this is small question, and I give you two minutes each. Okay. I'm not so sure what regional level of analysis means. Well, I will. Um, I believe uh, regional level here is more um, to think about the regional actors. So, okay, okay. So, um, regional actors, we could think about that. Or do you mean like the? Um, academic analysis, like area studies analysis. So that's that's my question. Um, I think um, area studies, for example, in our field will always contribute a lot to, um, you know, more general um, questions, sometimes in making us understand difference and sometimes in actually making us understand how similar problems are um, in different regions. When it comes to regional actors, then you know it's again it's a question of not only resources but of willingness too so we have um, some regional actors with you know fewer resources like the african union for example and we have others with more but less will like the european union for example which you know seems to be at the moment very much interested just in sort of shoring up its own neighborhood and even there it looks very often very helpless in uh, in the attempts um, of doing it so um, in that respect, I'm not quite sure whether I would, um, you know, put all my hopes on regional actors to sort of um, go beyond what the what the UN is doing. I mean, you know, never give up hope, but um, that's sort of my opinion. What do you think, Marcos? Yes, uh, I think uh, thinking more about the, the well, the region that I know more that's Latin America. Our problem here is that the regional level, we see a lot of offer uh, a lot of overlapping of regional organizations. No? So we have organization of American states on one side and also the CARICON in Caribbean and the UNASUR that not advance anymore because political problems. And then this make more difficult to, uh, to think um, uh, coordinated policies or for diffusion and to, to deal with the blockage to peace. And uh, for example, the UNASUR had uh, an important moment for example, trying to deal with the uh, criminal uh, transnational organized crime. You know? uh, they had a very interesting architecture to deal with this. That's a problem that uh, created blockage to peace in Latin America in particular, but because the political problem that did not advance and now the UNASUR is virtually dead. No, it does not exist anymore. And so I think that in Latin America, our main challenge when we think about these questions of Marilla is this overlapping and that make it difficult to coordinate policies to deal with, uh, to, to trying to, to, build, to build peace. And can I maybe add one more thing to this? Um, we, of course, also in these regional organizations, we have the same kind of problem that we see um, in other parts of the, um, you know, of the international environment that we're operating in, which is if there's a shift towards authoritarian government, which we can currently see in different regions, then, you know, these are the people who are dominating these regional organizations too. So in how far are they interested in, you know, really sort of dealing with the root causes of all of these conflicts? That's, of course, you know, a big question. Or if they want to deal with conflicts at all, 
um, in how far they're not maybe interested in just, you know, cracking down on one side of the conflict to sort of try and um, pacify things this way. So the more we can see that, for example, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm much more familiar with, you know, the Middle East and, and Sub-Saharan Africa than I am with um, Munio region, but there we can very clearly see that the authoritarian trend is, you know, very much shifting even the countries that were already on the path to sort of democratizing currently backwards towards authoritarian regimes. If that's now the current trend, I'm not seeing much hope for regional organizations. Thank you. Thank you for these reflections. I believe this uh, this was one winter question to, to end because we are actually talking of a global framework, an architecture of peace, and then the regional um, uh, functionality of this and how we have different actors acting at different levels. And this has uh, become a melting pot in the local at the local level. So it's very important that we address uh, both uh, all levels of analysis when we are looking at the concepts that we address here. And I thank you both of you for this amazing discussion and hope we can engage further in another event. Thank you again. And actually, I also uh, thank you in the name of Professor Rafael Villa, which is our director at the center. And um, Hope to see you soon for another event. Thank you. And thank you to all our audience for um, asking us these great questions and listening to us in the first place. Thank you. Thanks for Camilla for organizing this. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Camilla. Bye bye. Bye. bye.